In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So one of my favorite blessings comes from the mystic Julian of Norwich, and she says, live without fear. Your creator has made you holy, has always protected you, and loves you as a mother. Then I go on to say the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But that's a beautiful sentiment, and it's expressed again and again and again in Scripture. But it's certainly easier said than done. It is said that 365, one for every day of the year, uh, 365 times in Scripture... God or Jesus says, fear not. Fear not. And I happen to think more than evil, more than hatred, that fear is the cause of most of the bad things that we do to one another. Whether in our household, whether in our community, and amongst our friends, or whether on a more national scale, fear, I think, is the root of us failing to follow God failing to see a larger picture, failing to see ourselves within the context of other. I think fear can be an incredible poison. I've thought a lot about it over the last uh, couple of weeks as my children have gone back to school, and I don't think as adults we fully appreciate uh, what kind of transition that is every year, even if you're going back to the same school, uh, of going back in and mixing with that class and figuring out uh, where you are in, the, um, in, in, in that dynamic uh, really getting back into gear. And uh, this year, as one headed to middle school, I started to think about what that transition into middle school was like, and I realized uh, it was probably one of the more difficult moments in my life. And my parents gave me the wonderful opportunity to have a first day of middle school twice uh, as we moved uh, in between uh, my seventh and eighth grade year. Uh, and I remember that I would have done anything to be cool. I remember every single fashion uh, fleeting uh, uh, fab I would buy into. I had cinched my pants and rolled them up. I had suspenders that weren't actually worn up but dangling around uh, my bottom. Uh, I had hair that the length in the back certainly didn't correspond with the sides in the front. Uh, I'm only glad that very few pictures were taken. My parents must have known this wasn't a time uh, I would want them to, to hold on to for years. Uh, but I would do anything. And if the shirt had the right insignia on it, I would have my mom pay three times as much, begging and pleading, uh, expressing to her how critical it was that I have this shirt, not the one that looks just like it without the insignia on the breast, but this particular shirt or this particular brand. Uh, and I was absolutely convinced that my value as a human being was based on how other people saw me, based on these rather superficial attempts uh, to fit in. That line from uh, the epistle, from the letter of Romans, uh, not to be conformed by this world, but to be renewed in our mind, uh, to be renewed for uh, the works of God, for knowing the knowledge uh, of what God calls us to do, uh, was probably the last thing that describes me as a middle schooler. I was held captive by fear. If I were to be particularly honest, uh, instead of celebrating the gifts that everybody brings to the table, uh, the gifts that Paul celebrates within the community of faith, each one of them was a threat to me. Each one of them, uh, whether it was somebody more athletic than me, someone uh, more talented with music, somebody uh, who was a better artist, somebody more popular, somebody more handsome, it was all a rung uh, farther down the ladder. And that's what fear does. When you look at that first lesson, uh, and if you remember as a child, the first time you ever read that story, uh, uh, Moses and the Bulrushes, do you remember opening up the children's book and remembering the story? I only thought of the Pharaoh as a bad guy. Like he was just your stock bad guy. Moses and his family were the good guys. But it's a little more complicated than that. The Pharaoh is struck by fear. He gets into power and he realizes that he has an untenable situation. He realizes that the system that's been put into play is eventually going to turn on him and on Egypt. Uh, they've had a lot of people doing their work, uh, getting stronger, multiplying, uh, while they've uh, become soft and accustomed uh, to other people carrying the load. Uh, and he realizes as they continue to, uh, to grow in number, as they continue to grow in strength, um, that this is not going to sustain itself. 
Uh, and so out of desperation, out of fear, uh, instead of realizing the gifts uh, that they have as a whole, instead of uh, coming up with a solution that points towards the kingdom of God or God's will and God's purposes, uh, he responds out of fear and says, we need to start killing. We need to start keeping them at bay. Or else they threaten all the things that we hold, our security, our power, our place, and they respond out of fear. And when they do so, um, they'd start killing innocent babies. And I love how the, uh, uh, the midwives, uh, they come in and they, they actually use uh, the, uh, the Pharaoh's fear against them. Uh, the, the, they're tasked with going and, uh, and, 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 and killing the, the, the firstborn boys uh, in each family. Uh, and they refuse to do so because uh, their fear is not in what the world can do to them. Their fear is their loyalty to God. And they come in and they almost poke fun at the Pharaoh. And the Pharaoh says, well, why aren't you doing your job? And she says, well, you know. They're just so good at it. They're so strong and they're so much not like uh, the Egyptian women that they just have the babies in the field and then they're working that day. We can't keep up with them. Uh, And the Pharaoh, it only sort of ignites his fear uh, even more. Um, uh, But when we respond out of fear, we do devastating things. When we respond out of hope, which is one of the things that the church has the opportunity to do. Not only to have the conversation, not only to call out injustice, uh, but in our own lives and in our uh, corporate lives, uh, we can be people who carry hope, who offer possibility, who say the story isn't finished being told. If we stopped last week's story two weeks ago uh, when Joseph was in the well and his his brothers were deciding whether to kill him or to sell him into slavery, uh, we, we wouldn't have gotten the whole picture of a God who reconciles, a God who pulls together, a God who never lets the story end uh, when we think the story is over, Uh, a God who binds up what has been broken down. Uh, And if we look at this story, the story with Moses uh, in the bulrushes, we forget that the story ends with Moses triumphantly leading his people out of slavery. And I think that's part of the reason why in today's gospel we have Jesus uh, who's who's testing his uh, disciples. They've uh, fed thousands of people. They've they've, they've done miracles. uh, And he's taking stock of where they are. He wants to provide a sense of context for his followers, the ones closest to him. And he says, who do they say that I am? And they say all the great prophets, and some say this, and some say that. And then Jesus turns to him and says, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter enthusiastically raises his hand and he says, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. You're God incarnate. And he says, yes. But he says, don't tell anybody. People have always wondered, why, if God has come to reveal himself in Jesus Christ, why at this moment does he say, don't tell anybody? And I believe firmly it's because the story is just a snippet at that point in time. If all came to believe in that moment that he was the Messiah, their expectations would have been dramatically different. Their expectations already were that the cross would not have been a triumphant end, but it would have been a defeat. That only with the lens of all of it, looking back, do we understand um, that the cross is a moment of triumph. That the empty tomb uh, is the fulfillment of all that had been promised all the way through. And that both of those things can't be seen without understanding the love that is revealed in Jesus in the teaching and the revelation of God in Jesus. That we need all of it together in order for us to be able uh, to really see beyond the moment. Just like the moments we find ourselves in. When we put on blinders and we see just that little snippet of it, we don't see the whole story being, uh, being told, being unfolded. And Jesus knew that. Jesus said, don't tell anybody until the end, until the whole thing makes sense. And you realize that everything that I've done, everything that I've shown you has been part of that promise, part of that gift that allows you to live without fear, to know that you were made holy. You were made so worthwhile that I came uh, in human form to show you how holy you are, that I've always protected you even on the other side of the grave, even past death. And that I've always loved you, like a mother loves a child, loved you even enough to give my life over on the cross. 
All of that all of a sudden makes sense in the whole corpus uh, of the story. And when we stop in a moment, we miss it. And But what we can do as a church is to realize there is a much larger story rolling out. We can carry that hope, that promise uh, that our current moment uh, is fleeting. That we can live without fear. And so I invite you to really chew on those words of Julian of Norwich. Live without fear. Your creator has made you holy, has always protected you, and loves you as a mother. Amen.